Well, good morning and good afternoon and good evening from wherever you're joining us. Many of you know Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft. And many of you who know me know that uh, I'm a huge cricket fan. Satya Nadella said that in playing cricket all of his life, his formative years, he learned more about business and business processes than he learned while working in business itself. Now, my goal for this session is not to necessarily talk about the parallels between business and cricket, but I do want to take you down a little bit of a journey. For those of you that are even remotely familiar with cricket, apparently the gentleman's game, the jury is still out on that, you would know that cricket traditionally began as a five-day game, and it could still end up in a draw after five days. After a period of time, it got shortened into two days, one day, and then slowly but surely, it became a three-hour, two-hour phenomenon. Take it into India, and you mix it with the masalas of Bollywood and music, and you get the cricket version of the Football Premier League, the Indian Cricket League, the Indian Premier League. And that's now transformed the way cricket is being played globally. Not only did it transform the way the game is being played, it transformed how countries were now preparing players for the game. Often now, players are now choosing between their home state or the franchise that they're with. Because that's at the core of transformation. Transformation is not about let's have change for the sake of it. Transformation really comes about when the pain of uh, remaining the same outweighs the pain of change. You know that you cannot continue to stay the same. You have to change, and you have to go through that process. That's why we have this session today. Not about digital change in the pandemic, but digital transformation. How have businesses transformed, been forced to transform as a result of the pandemic? And my guests today bring perspectives from Canada and from Israel, as well as the United States. Two of my guests will introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about what they do, and more importantly, we'll then jump into what do we mean when we talk about digital transformation and how do we do it securely? Before I begin, I do want to thank Mayor Sean Collier, the town of Ajax, and Madhi Raza from CyberX. This facility here at the St. Francis Center is a gorgeous facility, the first of its kind for cybersecurity media. We are on the land of the peoples of the Skugog Islands First Nation. And more importantly, this land is protected under the Williams Treaties. Without further ado, Please join me in welcoming my panelists. May I'll turn it over to you first. A quick introduction. Where are you calling in from and what is it that you do? Thank you, Ali. So my name is May Brooks Kemper. I've been a cybersecurity professional for almost 20 years. I'm based near Tel Aviv, Israel. That's where I'm located now. So for me, it's quite late at night. But hopefully you'll enjoy it. Fantastic. May I do appreciate you taking out the time, joining us all the way from Israel. And I must also add that if, uh, for those of you who are interested in the art of how do you talk about cybersecurity, May does have a book, and more importantly, a very fascinating TED Talk on children and cybersecurity, which I highly recommend that you tune into. May, welcome to the Cyber Exchange, and thank you for joining us. We'll make sure that, uh, Maddie, after the session, Uber eats you a really nice dessert, or at least some coffee or the equivalent of it in Tel Aviv. <laughs> Neil, thank you for all that you've been doing on the Cyber Exchange Advisor. You've been on every meeting, you've been supporting and guiding us. Neil, a quick introduction, what is it that you do and what brings you to the Cyber Exchange? Sure, thank you, Ali, for having me today. Uh, I currently work at uh, TD Bank in Canada. I'm based out of Toronto. Uh, I've been in the financial industry for about 17, 18 years now. I'm a, currently a technology executive at TD, and I oversee the quality engineering organization within Canadian banking. So that covers functional, non-functional, uh, security, performance, et cetera, testing uh, for all of our products that we deliver to our customers. Fantastic. Now, before we begin, I do want to mention that one of my mentors, who you all met at the Power Hour two weeks ago, uh, Bill Harmer, he is expected to join this session. He is running late on another call. So uh, he will join in, and we will seamlessly transform into a two-panel uh, group to three-member three, uh, three panel. So play along with me as I enjoy this discussion. We'll jump right into it. Neil, before I begin, the cricket reference, did it resonate with you, or is cricket persona non grata in your books? No, no, it was a great example uh, and a great analogy uh, as you can kind of compare the sport to what's happening around us. So I'm glad that you brought that up to set the context for the conversation. 
Fantastic. So as Maddie owes uh, May a nice coffee or a dessert, he's going to owe us a nice drink so that we can talk all things cricket. Let's jump right into this. <laughs> That's and, right. Well, I'll be a very unproductive in basketball, but if you want to change to basketball, then we're, game, we're on. I'm sure Maddie would like to talk basketball and the Raptors, but we can we can talk about that some other time. It's all about cricket on this stage right now. Anyways, let's jump right into digital transformation. Staying in tune with Satya Nadella, I quoted this uh, last week when I was on the Power Hour. That Satya says that you know in two months we've witnessed two years of digital transformation. In your perspective, we'll start with me. What do you mean by digital transformation? Well, I think the, the biggest issue we had in Israel was actually with the financial sector, with banks. In Israel, there's the bank's commissioner, and he actually decided that banks in Israel cannot work remotely. That's a decision from a few years ago. Now, it has nothing to do with cybersecurity because we all know working remotely is completely possible while maintaining security. However, that was the decision. And all of a sudden, when COVID-19 started, all of the banks in Israel found themselves in a situation where they need to be, they need to continue working. They can't work in the offices, they can't work in the branches, they have to work remotely. And I think that was an incredible digital transformation that happened over a period of about two weeks. Yep. One of my personal and very close friends is the deputy CISO of the largest bank in Israel. And we've been talking a lot about this digital transformation and how they had to do it very quickly and efficiently while maintaining security. So I think it's an incredible opportunity as well as being a necessity. I think there are two terms that, that you've used which are very crucial and we'll underline that as we sort of uh, move to, to Neil. And that was the aspect of efficiency and security. And one might think very falsely that we have an aptitude to take on new technologies because as human beings, you find us very intrigued by new and, and shiny objects and what's the latest and greatest, but efficiency and security. And I think I want to come to that with Neil. And that is we often find ourselves busy with looking at new technologies, right? Uh, you yourself, and again, the parallel with the finance sector and the banking sector, you get, you get to see new e-commerce applications. You get to see new tools that you can use uh, to run your to run your day-to-day -day affairs. But there's a difference between being busy and efficient. How, in your case, do you look at digital transformation, and how do you make those decisions on what tools can transform our work efficiently versus what tools can just transform us, but not in the right way? And Neil, before you answer that, I will say a hello to, uh, to my dear friend, uh, Bill Harmer. I think, Mr. I think, therefore I am. He connected, therefore he is. Bill, we've just gotten into the conversation, but I already uh, took a moment for May and Neil to introduce themselves. I will give you uh, the platform to announce your existence in your typical style. Uh, take the next 30 seconds to tell us about uh, what brings you here and uh, what is it that you do. Uh, my name is Bill Harmer. I'm the chief evangelist and CISO for a company called SecureAuth. Um, we are a market leader in the identity space. Um, I guess what brings me here is the, the future of what we're doing, the digital transformation. Digital transformation has been part of my life for the last 20 years. Um, I did my first SaaS startup in 1999. I haven't stopped since. Um, and I just want to see if I can help impart information, knowledge, or ideas onto people and how they can look at the future because we are at a tipping point in human history um, as to the convergence of the real world, the digital world, all those cool things that we read about when we were younger with the netizens and the cybers and all that stuff, it's happening. Um, and I think we have an opportunity to embrace it and, and move forward um, productively. And in keeping with the spirit of transformation, we've just transformed from a two-member panel to a three-member panel, and we've done it seamlessly. This is what digital transformation in the pandemic is all about. Neil, we'll go back to you, and we were talking about this aspect of how do you sure. determine from a digital transformation perspective what tools are good to go and what tools less so? They're both shiny, but as we all know, not all the things that shine are gold. Neil. No, thank you for the question. Yeah, and I think I can, you know, a lot of things that May was talking about resonated very closely to what we're seeing and what we're experiencing in North America. Uh, TD, like many FIs, has experienced a very fast technology pivot uh, that has brought tens and thousands of employees and millions of customers online in a very short time span. 
Um, TD, uh, from our experience, we've seen digital engagement up by 30%. That's via online, via mobile platforms across Canada compared to pre-COVID time. So what usually would take years to see this kind of growth is now happening in months. So uh, it, it's, it's quite significant to see the change Absolutely. happen in, in this way. Um, and so, you know, right now, uh, the, the focus has really been to really focus on how we can get our customers enabled online as, as effectively as possible. And the interesting shift we've seen is, you know, a number of folks that usually rely on the branch network to fulfill their, their, their transactions and, and to support their financial needs are now moving online. So the, the, the focus for the bank and for many of us is to digitize our forms, digitize the experience, enable those capabilities. Yep. for our customers to be able to transact with more simplicity, with more effectiveness, efficiency, et cetera. Uh, and now the feedback we're getting is that, you know, the folks are enjoying the and embracing the experience and they don't really want to go back to the old way of doing things. They, they really want to stay online and do more online. So the ability for us uh, uh, to, uh, to support this, this uh, employee and customer base continually is, is paramount. You know, we've grown quickly and we've learned a lot. We have to sustain that now moving forward. Fantastic. So May and Neil, you sort of come to me with the set model, right? It, digital transformation is secure, it's efficient, and it's timely. And I'm going to come back to that a little bit and look at some specific examples of where companies have transformed successfully and less so. But before that, I'm going to turn it back to my friend Bill Harmer. And for our audience, the one thing that I will say, if you haven't watched it already, the Power Hour on uh, logging and authentication and identity access management. Very, very useful to understand new perimeters in security. Uh, builds a person who's, uh, you, know, you know how we say integrity is about consistency between action and words. I think you'll see that in what he's about to explain to you about transformation. Bill, in your perspective, what is digital transformation in light of the pandemic? Um, I would say in light of the pandemic, well, the, for the horror that COVID's brought us, um, I always try to at least find something good somewhere. Um, and what we're seeing is we're seeing uh, organizations, people, uh, functions that are looking at new ways of doing things. So uh, the way Neil was talking about TD, um, former TD customer when I lived in Toronto, um, they, you had people, you have people that would think um, moving to doing online banking is, is dangerous, or they hear the horror stories of the crazy stuff about hackers and how they're gonna steal their information. Um, they'll do it on a computer, but they won't do it on a mobile. They make all these decisions based on the bits they may or may not know. COVID went, yep, yeah, no choice, off you go. Um, because now they can't go out. They're forced to make these changes. Um, so digital transformation is now organizations looking pri primarily at the user experience first, and function and security are sort of coming a tight second. Um, I've always said security is a balance of user the digital transformation that we're seeing today is people being pushed out of their comfort zone into those areas to make those decisions as to how they're going to operate going forward. Now, the one thing that we learn is once they do it, and if we make it easy and pleasant for them, they will do it again, even if there's a high, um, um, maybe uh, uneasiness factor, if you will. Um, and for instance, things like uh, biometrics. Talk to any security professional, uh, we did a little survey and we found that only about 32% of security professionals trust the company that they may or may not share their biometrics with, but over 55% of them use them, right? And that is because it's usability first. So that is, I think, what we're seeing. In light of the pandemic, we're seeing a massive, massive push out of necessity and out of survival. And change is simply an act of survival. So they, businesses realize now, even the, the fast followers are the ones that we're, we're cautious about this, have no choice and must change. So the new normal coming out of this will be different. Any business that says, oh, I'm hanging on to all my real estate and all my commercial property because everybody will go back to the office, 
Yeah. Don't bank on it. Um, they, we've seen it with Google. We've seen it with Facebook. But we've also seen it with big traditional companies like Siemens has said, yeah. all users, anywhere, anytime. And the new, the ones that will come out of this ahead will be the ones that embrace that change and prepare, uh, prepare for it. Change as a matter of survival, transformation as a matter of existence. And I think we need to imbibe that into our DNAs. And the successful companies have been transforming repeatedly, not just as a result of the pandemic. Let's take this context that's been set. And I want to go back to, to May, and then we'll go to Neil and Bill. May, you started us off really eloquently on the aspect of fintech and banking innovation. And, I wanna, and, and Bill made a reference to real estate, so on and so forth. So let's stay within that canvas and talk a little bit about this. A couple of days ago, I was talking to a friend of mine, and, and May, I don't know how, familiar, how this environment translates to what you have in Tel Aviv, but in any real estate transaction here in Toronto, uh, if you are getting a mortgage on it, as most people tend to do, um, you inevitably uh, have to go and get, you know, get, uh, you get the mortgage secured and you get an appraisal done. An appraisal on the property meant that a, an appraiser, I don't know what qualifications they have, they basically walk through your home and walk through your neighborhood and define whether the value that you're buying the home at is worth that value and the bank can go ahead and provide you with that mortgage, essentially invest in you and do whatever it needs to do from there. Today though, that appraisal process has been transformed. Now the customer, the mortgage applicant, has to go through the home and take pictures of various elements of the home and send it to an appraiser. Bill brought up the aspect of trust, and I've always retained this. Trust of data is not about who, see, who has my data, it's about what you're going to be doing with it, because I really can't control who in your organization. Tomorrow you have one appraiser, to the, tomorrow the other. I need to know what you're going to do with it. Can you talk to us a little bit about how does trust factor in when we do digital transformation, May? Um, well, I think that to be honest, it's, I think that you, po that you pinpointed one of the problems. I think that the other problem is, can they trust the data that I'm providing them? If I'm taking pictures of my house and I want to get a mortgage, I will obviously not take pictures of the ruined parts and yep. the falling apart parts. I will only take pictures of the nice bits. And I think that we have a problem in both areas, both of what we provide and how and whether that data can be trusted and also how they are going to use that data. And I don't think that the current pandemic really changed that all that much. I think it's a problem and I think it's a conceptual problem more than anything. And if we look in a second at trust issues in the internet, we know, we all know that people do things online that they would never do face to face. Correct. People lie online. People do not think about online fraud the same way that they will think of face to face fraud. People will lie about themselves, about their companies, about everything online. And I think that is a serious problem. I think that we should, well, that is my personal angle that we have to start from a very young age explaining that the same things that we wouldn't do in real life, we, we shouldn't do online. That's and I true. think that is part of the conversation that we're not talking about because now with digital transformation, we all know that we changed everything to go digitally. If I look at my children, if I look around the world, children are learning remotely. They're using Zoom to be, instead of being physically in school. Right. And I think that is part of the thing that we have to consider as an industry how we are going to actually change the way people behave because of this transformation. Neil, I noticed uh, you were probably looking at your phone for a second, maybe booking a meeting with the mortgage department at TD to talk to them about the possibilities of folks uh, sending out wrong images. The property is worth 500, but suddenly I have a pool in the backyard with all sorts of other things and uh, you know the drill from there. But there's a very, very interesting aspect around uh, trust and there's a very interesting aspect about not just trust from the perspective of can the consumer trust what they're receiving, what they're providing, but also what you as the organization can trust. From your perspective, when it comes to digital transformation, specifically in light of the pandemic, how challenging has it been to prepare your teams to now do activities which typically they would not conduct in one way or the other, like this appraisal, like the rece receiving of information? What are the policy implications? How quickly were you able to sort of mitigate and move policy in a way that you could allow what previously would not even be thought of? Neil? So it's a very interesting topic. Uh, last year, uh, TD launched, like many other FIs, a, a digital mortgage application. 
so we had to sort of uncover some of the challenges that that was uh, that was presenting, and really focus on educating our our employees and our customers on what the experience actually meant to them. Um, improving literacy around cybersecurity has been a really big focus for us, both internally and to our customer base. Um, ensuring that the right safeguards in place, that we have the right resiliency across our systems and our platforms is paramount to ensure that the experience is one that the employees and our customers can actually trust. Um, it, it goes without saying, though, that you know, with, uh, with the shift we've seen over the last few months, the threat landscape for our financial institutions is again being transformed, right? The explosion of our digital financial services and mobile banking has exponentially expanded the attack surface that criminals can exploit. So, you know, attacks, uh, cyber attacks against fraud, against our, our networks, our systems, our employees, um, social engineering uh, and malware. I mean, the threats continue. And, and while we are doing what we can to defend and, and evolve, um, our, attackers, our attackers don't give up, right? They keep, continue to adapt and find new ways uh, of, uh, of trying to, um, uh, you know, disrupt the entire um, integrity of the bank and, and uh, exploit whatever they can right. um, uh, across the country. So um, building uh, out our, our digital platforms has a, a, a strong focus around security. And uh, the dialogue around security and the resiliency that we're building internally um, is, so, is one that we continue to focus on with our employees and our customers so that they understand um, that their data is protected, uh, that the integrity of that data is upheld, and that uh, we've got the right safeguards in place to ensure that they're not uh, are, um, exploited or, um, or stolen uh, from third parties. Fantastic, Neil. Let's build a little bit of a fence around that aspect of safeguards. And I want to turn to Bill. Um, and extending from our conversation at the Power Hour and conversations that I heard you deliver at Canadian Women in Cyber, as well as at CISO Forum, which, believe it or not, was last year when you were in person at Niagara Falls. Uh, quite remarkable uh, to realize that it was one year ago. Shout out to the CyberX team for making that wonderful event happen. Um, Bill, let's go back to this aspect of safeguards. Now, you and I both have had these discussions around, it's, if you look at how a lot of companies, large enterprise in this case, do some of the digital transformation, they have incubator-like zones where they look at new products. For example, we have Mohsen Azari, uh, lead of security at Walmart Canada. They have Walmart Labs. We have Shahid Saya, the CISO at Maple Leaf Sports Entertainment. They have the digital labs at Maple Leaf Sports Entertainment. They all have areas where they're able to look at ideas, look at new tools, look at the security parameters around it, and see if it's worth it for them going forward. In comes in corona, and in comes in the pandemic, and you've got to now move at 100 times the pace that you were moving previously. Do we have the right safeguards in place and the right kill switches? Is there a way for us to say we can go back? I've always asked this question around risk, and that is risk is about, you know, we can go down a path, but we know how to get back. Risky is we can go down a path, we just don't know how to get back. Do we have what we need that if we pick a particular transformation route that we can go back to our safeguards? Or right now, is it the wild, wild west of if you're going to pick something, go with it and see where it takes you, do or die? Um, no, I think, we, I think we have the safeguards in place. I think we do understand or we should understand. And if we don't understand, start learning um, or quit. Uh, and I, unfortunately, I have been known to tell people to quit their jobs um, because... <laughs> The, the truth of the matter is security people need to understand their business better, not the technology. This is not about who's putting in the right protocol on what port to scan what app. I truly don't care about that. What I care about is what can my business survive? What's important to my business? So if, if Neil worked for a, a, a company that made tables um, and it made round tables with you know, wood tops and aluminum legs, he needs to know where those legs get sourced from and protect that, that, uh, that uh, part of his supply chain. Because to take that company out of business, I don't have to attack the business. I have to attack the leg manufacturer. Maybe I can go farther down and attack the one company that they use to mine the ore to create the legs, to, et cetera, et cetera. But, but what I can render is his table company now makes giant platters, right? Um, and, and that's what we as security people 
I know that's sort of an ad absurdium type way of, of putting it out there, but we don't know enough about our business. What we always say is we're going to be secure. And the board says, how secure are we? And we say, well, we think we're 95% secure. That absolutely means nothing. Um, what we should be doing is saying we have accepted risk based on the board's recommendations or acceptable levels of risk in certain areas. Um, Again, if you go back to, to uh, you know, take GE, for instance, and if they were making, it, well, they do, they make washing machines and they make jet engines, which do you think are important, right? And if I put the same effort in protecting washing machine intellectual property as I do jet engines, I should be fired because I don't know my business, right? right? And we've done that across the board for everything because as security people, we put solutions on problems. Problem comes up, we put a solution on it. Somebody hacks a password, we make it longer, we make it more complex, we make it tougher, we cycle it faster, we do SSO because SSO was not, and that's actually a good example, SSO right there, was not an increase in security. It was a reduction in risk. Because what we did was we put all the eggs in one basket, we gave the user one complex password, hoped they didn't write that one down, right. and we said, here's the access to all of your things, but at least we have a little control that if, if you get popped, I can shut your entire access down through one piece. Then we started to learn about password replay attacks where the users would use that same one complex password because it was so good and easy to remember with Zappos and GoDaddy and any of the others that are getting hacked and we don't know about it for eight months until they come out and they're slamming away those passwords. So we have to start to adjust. That's, that's why I have been a proponent on getting rid of passwords, right? Um, and if you were to head down a password list route, what is your way back, right? Um, we are not going back to where we were. It's not happening. We are not undoing digital transformation. You may take a false start at it. You may say, uh, I'm going to try SD-WAN, and, and you start to build it out and go, that ah, doesn't work for me. I'm going to go direct to internet, right? But you should think about what your alternates are, not what your necessarily your way back is, unless you're thinking about the way back in is how do I get back to that same risk level? So my risk level was here. I took a chance on something. It increased my risk a little bit. Right. All right, I'm okay with that, but how do I get back to that risk level that's acceptable? That's my way back. Um, rolling back tech to put in old tech is not, uh, it's not an answer in my books. Yeah. Now that we've got a little bit of a philosophical hold on what we mean by digital transformation, I'm going to pick on two areas that I'm seeing come out of the questions, but also seeing coming out of some of the discussions that we've seen on cyberexchange.ca. You know, you mentioned something about you've been known to tell people to leave their jobs. And I want to add to that a quote by uh, the famous and the late Indian scientist, uh, Dr. Abdul Kalam, where he said, you know what, never fall in love with your company, fall in love with your job, because you never know when your company might pivot into a particular area. The focus on the person. And I want to talk about, since this panel is talking about the impact of digital transformation in COVID-19, in the light of COVID-19, I want to talk about this aspect of insider threats. One of the fallout products of digital transformation, let's just stick with that example of the appraisal, is that suddenly now that person that was coming into my home to do that appraisal may not be needed anymore. Rendered persona non grata, as I like to say. And as we're looking to cut costs, you're looking to, to trim and you're looking to remove some of the human resources because you can replace it with some automation, with some digital transformation. Do you think the cost of digital transformation is an increase in insider threats? May, we'll start with you. We'll go to Bill and then to Neil. May. Um, I think so because we have we have a new we have a new problem. People are working remotely. Yes, there is automation. Some of the controls that we used to do manually are done automatically. Some of the jobs we used to do manually are done automatically, which is an advantage and a disadvantage, but I think that the insider threat is far greater now that people are working remotely because it's much easier to do things without being caught, without someone noticing. Because if I'm in the office and people are all around me, I'm very conscious at what I'm doing, why I'm doing, who's looking at my work desk and etc. But if I'm doing things remotely and let's say I'm a disgruntled employee, I have the golden opportunity of working on things remotely, as I'm supposed to do, without anyone sort of keeping their eyes on me. So I think the inside the threat is a serious problem, both for malicious actors and for just human error and mistakes, because again, people are all alone. If they see a suspicious email, and usually they will just turn around and ask their coworker, do you think this is okay? They have no one to ask. So I think that the inside the threat, both the malicious one and the non-malicious one, 
are in some sort of an increase. I see it, at least in Israel, we see it quite, uh, well, we see a lot of these things, especially with non-malicious insider threats. Right. Let's take work on that and may let's look at the other side of the coin, Neil, with you. And May sort of looked at the aspect of now that somebody is receiving information, working from home, uh, we've transformed the way that we're working, that person who still has a job uh, could become a threat angle for a particular company. But do we, when we're thinking about digital transformation, do we understand how we need to work digitally with those individuals who are no longer a part of the firm? Many times you see disgruntled employees, for example, attack the firm in some shape or fashion, could be phishing attacks, could be whatever else have you. Do we have the right protocols in place, or what are the right protocols in place to ensure that that individual that is no longer a part of the team uh, will not impact us negatively as a result of our transformation? Neil, and I know this is a difficult question, uh, but it's one that we have to contend with. What happens when we willingly or unwillingly see an individual leave our organization? Neil? Yeah, I think, um you know, May touched on some really important points, and uh, she's absolutely right. I think uh, with the, the, the amount of people we have working remotely now, uh, we have to be very careful in the way they access and, and the way they navigate uh, with the information that they have at their disposal. Um, you know, we live at work now. Uh, we don't, uh, you know, I don't like re referring to it as we work from home. Uh, and so, you know, the, the line is blurred between, you know, personal and, and the work life in, in, in the home environment now. And that brings its own challenges. Um, and, you know, you're right, you know, through the digital transformation uh, experience, you know, we do see uh, in change in, in, in our staffing and, and the way that we distribute our work. Uh, and for good or for bad, uh, it does impact some employees. And, and, uh, and we have to ensure that we don't get into situations like Bill talked about, which, you know, which, which could uh, surface some credential replays or to mislead customers or employees in a certain way or to, uh, to uh, come up with you know, business emails that try to compromise uh, you know, uh, the integrity of the bank or the way that we're doing our work. So we are uh, trying to be as resilient as we can, and we try to have the, the, the most important um, offboarding processes that are available that we can execute to ensure that the right levels of access have been uh, uh, discontinued um, and that uh, the, the, uh, the access that they're used to having has been severed so that, you know, uh, the future attacks uh, or um, any malicious attacks that might come afterwards are, are, um, are minimal to none. Thank you for that. And we'll work a little bit further with that, with, uh, with Bill. And that is this aspect of what Neil mentioned, which is the aspect of access and identity. Once somebody is a part of our corporation, they assume an access, they assume an identity, and we authenticate them based on their role within an organization. Once they leave, you severe that. There's some human aspects to that. There's some uh, uh, auto automotive aspects to that, where we can have some kill switches to get people out. But how Bill has digital transformation and the pandemic impacted the need for more robust authentication mechanisms? Because not only do folks authenticate with devices, they can authenticate with emails as well, which needs to be typed in. How has digital transformation and the pandemic impacted the way you are now understanding the role of identity and authentication in a corporate environment? It has 100% identified identity as the key. Yeah. Um, we have spent better part of five, six years now, building out um, work anywhere concepts around security, the Zscalers, the Paolos, the Cisco umbrellas, the ones that um, enable uh, behavioral analytics, DLP, CASB, fire, you know, the, the stuff that we built internally to be everywhere, to be at home. Uh, there's nothing better than being able to say to an employee, yeah, if you work from home, you're gonna have the same level of security that you have at the corporate office. And that was a two-edged piece. One was we were protecting them when they were at home. Two, we were protecting our organizations when they were at home. Because um, as uh, May said, when somebody goes home and the eyes aren't on them, they feel a little different. Maybe there is better networking uh, analysis happening, or maybe there isn't. I would hope that there is, it's, or at least is consistent across both in on-prem and at home. But they feel, because I'm sitting here alone, there's nobody in the house, I might be able to try something or I might be more enticed to probe something or if I'm not feeling as, as thrilled with my organization and it's a malicious attack. Um, but the, the reality to all of this is when you enable that functionality, when you enable that remote access, when you enable 
users to be seamless in their day-to-day uh, -day lives where, um, as Neil said, you know, it's not a, a work-life balance. In truth, you're now just trying to find a way to live a balanced life. Um, you have to have an identity that um, to, a large, to a high degree of assurance um, can identify someone. And it's not as simple as just yes, no, Bill, not Bill, because perhaps uh, again, I'll, I'll pick on Neil because he's there and I know TD. Uh, Neil works for TD. Neil might also be a customer of TD. So if Neil leaves TD, either willingly or unwillingly, but Neil's still going to have an account, an identity at TD that's on the other side in the consumer world, right? And we even see this in, in hospitals with nurses where a nurse might be a shift supervisor during the day, pull some extra hours at night, just working as a regular ER nurse. Uh, nothing regular about them. I just mean regular access. Um, and because they, they know and love that hospital, we bring themselves there and their family there. So now they've got triple views of the same identity. And how do we start to manage and, and manipulate that identity so that it does truly reflect who they are? I think we've spoken about this a great deal in our power hours is the identity of one individual, one identity can have multiple identities within it. And that ability for users to also be deployers of service is a very interesting moment where we find ourselves in terms of digital transformation. And the pandemic has brought, as Bill mentioned, identified identity as one of the major things we need to be working with, which is where I want to sort of again go to another question that we have to come in. And I'll start with Neil and work with this idea of a user being a supplier of a service at the same time. And that is this aspect of the need to digitally transform, Neil, is driven by the fact that we have to keep the lights on. We've got to make sure that we are running profit. We're being profitable in our ventures and that we're not uh, running ourselves into the wall with our operations. I get that piece. But now digital transformation is also being measured by other standards and other ethical barometers as well. Digital transformation now impacts companies talking about how they're supporting social distancing, how they're supporting measures to keep people apart but keep them connected as well. How is that angle and how is the pandemic impacting how we decide which, transform uh, which transformations are worth it and which ones can we wait on? Neil? So, you know, I think uh, the pandemic uh, unfortunately impacted, you know, a number of uh, people around the world. And if I bring Canada into the context of the conversation, we had hundreds and thousands of, of, uh, of workers that... Uh, got impacted from a job perspective. Small businesses got impacted in, in profound ways. Um, and the government had to step in, like many governments around the world, to offer relief, uh, to offer economic relief to families, to businesses, so that they can uh, uh, you know, survive through this very difficult time and come out uh, with you know, some support uh, that, uh, that the government was willing to provide. So the government had to work across all of our FIs within Canada and, and released a number of relief programs for Canadians. And, and, and I think the banks uh, no, undoubtedly you know, um, stood in line and did what they needed to do to, to roll out uh, transformational, digital transformational capabilities to allow for customers to enroll online, for businesses to uh, enroll online, to elect to uh, get the, the assistance that the, the government was offering through the FIs, uh, to be able to support their families, to put food on the table, to be able to, uh, to, uh, to withstand some of the, the, the storms that were coming our way for the next uh, uh, few months. Uh, and uh, that uh, helped us really uh, take an inspirational approach to digital transformation, yep. where we were rallying uh, around a common cause and we were able to provide back to, the, to our communities in a, in a very impactful way. So that has offered us a prioritization, of course, uh, in, a, in the grander scheme of things. And the human element, it's been a, a, it's been a front and center uh, theme for uh, a number of uh, institutions. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, I think that has helped us not only transform digitally, but also make an impact where it matters. You know, not only because you're a humble individual, but, uh because you're very true to what you say, you kept referring to it as us, and we as the institution had to make certain decisions, not just from a profitability standpoint, but also how are we keeping in tune with our government expectations, because at the end of the day, they are partners in the operations that you run. 
I want to go to Bill and then we'll go to May. And May, you know, just as a heads up, I have a question very specifically that's coming about the context in Tel Aviv. So we'll come to that. But Bill, let me start with you. You know, you heard me, you've probably heard me allude to this during our power hour where I said, look, you know, a lot of people look at security as who's knocking at the door. For me, it's about, well, who's going to open that door? And who's the person that's making that decision on who do you let in? Whose responsibility is digital transformation? And Whose responsibility is it not just to say this is the way we're going to shape and reshape our businesses? Whose responsibility is it to make sure that from a security framework, we're subscribing to what's been recommended? Bill? Well, I think um, digital transformation is owned by the business, um, plain and simple. Um, that is the board and the CEO have to be looking at what their business is and how they are going to market with it. Um, a, a security is owned by security, but in truth, when you think about security, it should be owned by everyone. And, and I know it's a bit of an old saying, um, but what I, what I truly mean by that is if you think back to the early, early days, um, go back to the days of the, of the real Wild West. Um, you know, there were in some cases, no lawman or no law person in a town and somebody assumed the role and used what they had and their knowledge they had. But Eventually, what happened is, as we made it to today's society, barring your unusual events, um, people know what the law is to a, a reasonable degree. Um, and these, this is where I went back to saying, we make these, these dis risk-based decisions every day. We walk down the street, two o'clock in the afternoon on a Tuesday, and we look down an alley and go, yep, I can cut through there and I can save three blocks on my trip. Um, one o'clock in the morning on a Sunday, it's a different story, same alley, different decision based on it's really muscle memory. It's, it's right. the, 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 the common sense that we have. Um, and the internet is simply a new world that is so fresh. I mean, what, 20 years, um, that's not even a generation yet. Uh, so people still have to build up that part of themselves. Um, so I, I think um, really the, the, the ownership of the digital transformation um, is, is, owned by all of us at our organizations. Um, we have to look at what we do. We hire people to be the best at what they do in an area. Don't hire me for finance, that's right. not my area. Right. Um, but we hire great people to be in finance and they know how finan finance works. And um, this has been going, this part has been going on since like the eighties when you know dumb terminals were rolling out and people yes. thought they were losing their jobs. Um, and, and I know that because my father was a trainer in Imperial Oil and went around the country talking about changes simply in active survival. It's the only thing that, that survived from his presentation was the title. Um, <laughs> but what he was teaching them was that they are experts in their areas and they have to tell us how to apply the technology to it. The technology is not taking your job away. You have to learn the technology and how you can recommend and shape and, and mold it to what makes it best for your company. Uh, because again, finance is finance and, and people can learn finance. But if you go do finance at a SaaS company, that's a little different than doing finance at a pharma or finance in a bank, right? They all have different rules, different regulations, different uh, internal uh, ideologies on how they do things. Hopefully they're all legal. You know, when we talk finance, Enron did them differently. Uh, but we want to make sure that that knowledge is captured and, and brought into the technology right. so that it's not a cold, stark technology slapped across our processes. It's that the technology embraces the, the uniqueness of our organizations and how we do things and what makes us best at what we do in our vertical or in our horizontal or in our market share or whatever it is and uh, amplifies it. So um, I think everybody owns digital transformation top down. It's got to be a top down. You know, I think it's so important with what you've just mentioned is that you've spoken about digital transformation inwards in that as an organization, what new transformative tools can we take on? Who's responsible for it? What's the process that's in place and the frameworks and whatever else help you? And key to that is communication. Next, we'll have a session with Christy Honey, who is uh, the CAO at the town of Uxbridge, and she'll be talking about crisis communication. So that's a very nice little teaser for the next session that's coming up. We have another 15 minutes, and I want to move from what Bill very neatly captured for us about internal digital transformation versus external. And May, this is the perfect uh, stage to bring you back on. And that is this aspect of we don't just transform for our own functions, 
we also provide transformative opportunities for other companies. We are right now, you look at the plethora of companies that are now issuing out new event platforms. You look at you know, the plethora of companies that are offering you new video conferencing platforms, that are offering you new ways to engage with your companies. And the question that we have is kind of talking about in Israel, where you and I have spoken before, as the high, known as start, the startup capital of the world, where you have uh, the most number of startups per capita than anywhere in the world, how has the pandemic impacted how your companies there are offering more digital solutions, more transformations to other users out there. Have you seen a difference? Has it impacted the way you're talking about security in Tel Aviv? Tell us some more, May. Um, first of all, absolutely. I was sort of expecting this uh, yeah. question. Well, yes, we see a very big change. We see both for security companies, for high-tech companies in general, for startups, there's a huge amount of online events in Israel now, in a, well, globally as well. But I think that uh, we have so many new opportunities. There are a lot of startups um, working on things relating to the pandemic, both from a biological point of view and from a technological point of view. I've seen quite a few Israeli startups sort of pivot towards online work. Uh, remote work. So I did see a lot of that. I, we do see that all the time. I can tell you that personally, a few days after lockdown started here in Tel Aviv, I got a phone call from a friend, a CSO um, in one of the leading startups in Israel. They never work because they're sort of half military, half, uh, half a um, public company. So they never worked remotely before and they suddenly had to work remotely. So they had to do the digital transformation, that was one part, but they also had to do the sort of mental change to take all the employees through some sort of mental change. And we did a few specific about cyber security, how to rem safely w remote uh, work from home, how to do it, what should they do, what sort of information can they expose in front of their families, and things like that. So that we see a lot of things in Israel around that. We see a lot of events. And not just in Tel Aviv, I think in general. I yep. think that what we're doing right now is incredible. Because a year ago, you would never call me, can you participate in a panel from Israel and everyone else will be in the studio or on a stage and I will participate remotely. Right. And I've been to so many events like these in the last few months. And I think that is an incredible change in taking the world and really sort of building that village that everyone is talking about, the global village. So we're now in the midst of a global village. I've been doing talks all over the world without leaving my house. So it's really incredible. Let's work with that aspect of the global village and we'll go to Bill and then back to Neil. Um, and I really like this analogy of the global village because it implies a certain state of conditions in which we can all innovate. So Bill, let's, let's come to you and maybe dig up some of those political science engagements you had in your undergrad years and, and talk a little bit about a conversation I had with Sherry Rumble uh, from the Department of uh, Defense here in Canada. And I referenced Animal Farm. And we were talking about Napoleon the pig, where I said, you know what, the, the beginning was, uh, all animals are created equal. But then it ended up becoming, and some are more equal than others. Are you seeing certain sectors in your work that are seeing more rampant and rapid digital transformation versus others? Yesterday we saw healthcare, but are there other sectors, the airline industry, the fintech industry we've spoken about, any other industries that you're seeing are more active, rapid and rampant with their digital transformations because of the pandemic? Um, I honestly couldn't put, well, yes, uh, healthcare. Uh, sure. The, the health industry um, has just gone zero to 100 rapidly. Uh, and like May said, this, this is unprecedented times. And, and I did a, a talk last week in South Africa um, kind of wish I would actually get to go to Joburg, but no, uh, I did it remotely. Um, and, and the reason I was late today was because I had a customer call right up against us, and that's something I wouldn't normally do. I wouldn't back-to-back -back a customer call with a, with a live panel. But this, these are the things that we're having to learn, how to, how to manage these things. Health has been massive because um, they are overwhelmed to start with dealing with the COVID cases. Um, and so how do they get people the healthcare they need, if you have a rash, a cut, you've got a bump, 
uh, you've got some symptoms of something, how do you do it? So telehealth has just gone astronomical. That digital transformation, we're seeing it go all the way down the chain incredibly quickly because you need really reliable identity. You need super fast access to data when it comes to a doctor. Um, you can't be pulling out a phone and looking up an app to get a six digit code to MFA those patient records when the patient is lying there in cardiac arrest, right? So you, they're starting to figure out how do they separate these things? How do they make rational, reasonable, risk-based decisions on the situation? And they are, they are transforming massively. Um, I think you will start to see, uh, well, you'll, I think you'll see it across every industry, um, but the ones that I think will be hit the most are the ones that truly did not need people in the office. Right. Um, and those are the, the workers that are more digital or more um, uh, information workers, if you will. You know, um, you, you, you can't work from home in a factory that builds cars, it just doesn't work. Um, but you might see lessons learned from uh, the, the rest of the organ and back office that's working from home in how they can better manage those environments, um, how they can separate or provide different uh, access methodologies for them in those environments so they can continue to do their job, do their job better. Uh, maybe a shift supervisor could be remote if you had the right camera system set up so you can start blending and hybrid uh, things so you're taking less uh, you're having less personnel on the floor. It's only the necessary to run the machine, uh, et cetera. Or maybe they're just working from a different office where it's, it's safer. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever been to Stanford Shopping Mall. They actually have a robot security guard. Coolest thing I've ever seen. Uh, tools around. It's got video cameras. And they have several of these moving around where one guard can be watching all of them and then can respond to uh, an issue, a problem, a uh, health emergency in a certain area quickly. Um, so I think that's what we're going to see. We're going to see innovation hit based on necessity in some areas and how does it benefit others. Fantastic. And I think you've taken us on a really good tour of uh, where you're going to see this innovation. Yes, you mentioned healthcare quite a bit, but you brought up the aspect of manufacturing. You brought up the aspect of tourism as well. And all of them have underlying security mechanisms that need to be thought through. Great points that we can work with. And again, for our audience, if you have further discussions, you can always have them on cyberexchange.ca. We've got another two or so minutes, and I'm going to turn the conversation to Neil, and then we'll have some closing comments. And Neil, I want to pick on something that uh, Bill has not once, twice actually mentioned. That is the aspect of space and real estate. You know, I've often retained this statement that you truly and well and truly only see when the lights are turned off, because that's when you can actually pay more attention. That's when you're more cognizant. That's when your blind spots can get revealed. I have a question here, which I'm going to reword just a little bit, and that is from the aspect of what do companies need to be thinking about now that all of their workers or a good chunk of their workers are remote, and as Bill mentioned, remote perhaps for the rest of 2020 and even going further, as companies are rethinking their leases, et cetera, they still have assets within their corporate environments. Are there any security aspects that they need to be thinking about? Hint to that moment where recently, maybe about a month or so ago, there was an article about cleaning staff being uh, employed by hackers to get information. What do we need to be thinking about when the lights are turned off on our physical spaces from a security perspective? Neil? That's an interesting question, yeah. Um, I think uh, we have to be very uh, cognizant of, of privileged access and information. Um, and you know, we have to take a strong look at understanding um, you know, who has access to our buildings, who has access to our networks, our systems, et cetera. Um, ensure that we have uh, the right defenses in place, the right safeguards in place so that we're not only protecting um, our, our employees and our infrastructure, but we're also employing, uh, are protecting our customers. And so we've, come up, we've got to come up with, uh, you know, the right tools and the right means, detection methods, et cetera, to ensure that uh, we are tracking the, the movement in our real estate spaces, that we are uh, trimming down um, any real estate that we don't use anymore so that it's purposeful, that it's there for our essential staff. The people that need to be there can leverage the, the, the facilities that are there. Um, and uh, that way, the exposure, uh, uh, the net that we have um, diminishes and, it, and it's uh, you know, uh, brought, brought to a, a, a level that is appropriate for what we actually require. Fantastic. If, if I Go could ahead. jump on yes. that as well, um, 
one of the things that, that, that is at the core of zero trust or CARTA or however you want to buzzword it is exactly that. There should be no privileged access simply because I physically have access to a property. Right. It makes no sense and it leaves us blind. So the at the core, if one thing that you do out of all of this is you simply no longer trust your corporate networks, you treat them all as hostile, you will be that much farther ahead. Fantastic. And I think this is so essential to this aspect, not just of the zero trust piece, but also realizing that now security is not just about the, the technology lights going off. It's also about the policy that you set in place. And it's also about that guard that's sitting at the front of the building, taking your temperature and saying, hey, are you coming to pick up a laptop? Well, it's not as simple as here's my ID. I can pick up whatever I want from my desk. There is more to that. And there are more folks that come to that conversation. Now, we have another minute or so left. So I'm just going to turn to Maeve very, very quickly, just to give her the next 30 seconds, because I mentioned it at the start, May, your book talks a little bit about transformation as well. Can you just summarize what, what got you, what, what was the ethos behind your book, what got you into writing it, and where can somebody access it? Um, well, first of all, thank you very much. Um, the book will be released in the US and uh, North America in general, probably around mid-October, maybe a bit later than that. Pandemic did take its toll on that as well. Um, the book is basically my personal belief that everyone should know cybersecurity, that it is the equivalent, it's the 21st century equivalent of road safety in the early 20th century. No one was born with the knowledge of looking right and left before they crossed the road. We weren't born with this knowledge, but everyone teaches their kids how to cross the road safely. And I believe that it is just a new technology but we have to know the tools. And to be honest, I saw too many, too many incidents where people were just not aware of the risks, were not aware of simple practices that they can use to keep themselves and their loved ones and obviously their businesses safe. So that was inspired the TED talk and the book and, um, and my uh, Think Safe Cyber community in Israel that is now going global, very exciting. And that is my true belief that anyone can be cyber safe if they know the right tools. So that's the idea. And this, the book is filled with anecdotes and stories. Some of them are very well known, like WannaCry and NotPetya, and some of them are less known, like the AIDS uh, ransomware. And that's just in the ransomware bit. So we have a lot of things there, a lot of content, and I hope people will enjoy it. I put that in there strategically to sort of close on that note and bring us to the shores here of our conversation, simply because you've replicated the exact concept I spoke about at the start, which is digital transformation is not just about what we do with technology and what we do with cyber, it's about how we talk about it, how we converse about it, and more importantly, the examples that we're able to bring to the fore so that everyone realizes, just like I spoke about the security guard at the front, the importance of security being a conversation not for one person, but for all of us. And security fa factors very heavily as we're looking to secure our futures uh, amidst this pandemic. Before I thank all of you, I do need to say this once more that you are bo you're all fascinating folks to, to engage with, make it extremely easy for myself as a moderator uh, to learn, but more importantly, to take back key notes and apply them in my own practices here at Durham College, here in the town of Ajax, and just in general as well. I want to thank you for your time, and I remind our audience that you know, as I'd mentioned earlier on, is think very critically about the words that are being used to describe something. Um, here we talked about digital transformation, and you heard Bill talk about the aspect of identifying identity and knowing, taking no illusions of privilege. You heard uh, Neil talk about the aspect of there is not just uh, innovation that's happening internally, but it's innovation that's happening externally and transformation that's happening. You have to time your decision, or what we call the set model, secure, efficient, and timely. And you had May talk very eloquently about the fact that there are two sides to the transformation coin. What I will tell you is that what I've learned from this engagement today is that digital transformation is not about what's the next product that's going to go on our shelf. It's about asking, do we need the shelf to begin with? And with that, I thank you for your time. Bill, May, Neil, you were awesome. 
I'll see you on cyberexchange.ca. I know you have one or two more sessions coming up, but this conversation and this cyber community is growing. Beyond this week of engagements, I'm sure we'll be in touch. Take care, and to the audience, I look forward to uh, seeing you next, uh, or rather having you join when Christy Honey speaks about the importance of crisis communication. Thank you very much. Take care.